with you. Let's let's start with the outlook for uh, for the economy here. Um, how is the economy performing relative to where you thought we'd be at this time? Uh, it's uh, our expectations for growth are about two percent for this year. If you asked me on, in April, I would have said two and a half percent. And right now, I'd say the risk to our two percent forecast are to the downside. And the reason for that is, even though the consumer is very strong and is a key underpinning of the economy, manufacturing sector is is weak and probably weakening. And global growth decelerating is probably finding its way to seep into the U.S. economy. So I'd say uh, we're still expecting 2% growth for the year, but I think the risks are uh, a little bit more to the downside. Can you put some numbers on that downside risk? Is 1% growth possible? Is a recession possible? Uh, I, as long as the consumer stays strong, we're going to have solid growth. The thing I'm watching for is does this manufacturing weakness and global growth weakness seep into other sectors where eventually you start getting one or two negative job reports and then consumers start to be less ro less robust. I think we can avoid that, but I think it'll, it'll help uh, if we have some policy stability, it will help. And I think the Fed may well have a role to play in helping to uh, uh, engineer that. What kind of role would that be to play? Would that mean further rate cuts ahead? Uh, I, I was in favor of, of the rate cut in July. Uh, I felt it was appropriate to make an adjustment. You know, part of this job is to be forward-looking, and uh, there's a risk management part of the job. And uh, I, I want to take all the time between now and September to assess how the economy's uh, acting, I, and I'd like to avoid having to take further action, but I think I'm going to have an open mind about taking action uh, uh, over the, at least the next number of months if we need to. And for me, the global, the, the global yields, but particularly the U.S. yield curve, I'm less obsessed with whether the two to 10 and the movements back and forth. I'm more focused on the fact the whole curve has moved down over the last three and a half months. And the Fed funds rate at two to two and a quarter is now above every rate along the curve, which to me is a little bit of a reality check that says it's possible our, our uh, monetary policy setting is a little tighter than I would have thought three or four months ago. Um, when you look at global rates, do you see that maybe you have to bring the Fed rate more in line with global rates? I, I don't think I don't think we need to do that. Uh, uh, I, I think the reason that global rates rates outside the U.S. are low, they've got some some specific reasons. One of them is to the extent you have trade uncertainty, it can affect the U.S., but has a much bigger effect on countries outside the U.S. who have a much bigger percentage of GDP. So it, that doesn't surprise me. Also, quantitative easing and the uh, number of activities by the ECB and other central banks have been far more aggressive in terms of buying sovereigns and corporate debt. So I, I want to be careful not to follow other central banks in a race lower. Uh, but I, I, I do watch uh, what it says about prospects for future growth. Uh, Robert, the odds that you come on CNBC to talk on a day when the president hasn't tweeted about the Federal Reserve are very low. So here you are on another day where the president has said, uh, noting that German interest rates are negative uh, and that the Fed is behind the curve. And um, do, do you th see that American interest rates ought to be competitive with foreign interest rates? Uh, uh, the answer is, is, is no. Uh, there, the, there should be some divergence, and it makes sense based on underlying fundamentals that there's divergence. Uh, but let me, let, me, let, me, let me just push back a little bit on that. The divergence right now is more than 200 basis points. I understand. That's a lot of divergence. And divergence so, with a capital D. And so um, what I'm focused on is, in particular, is what's the growth potential of the U.S. economy? Uh, when I look outside the U.S., I'm trying to look at what's going on in terms of global growth that might affect our growth potential. And I think we need to adapt rates that fit the U.S. economy. And also, uh, other countries have lowered their rates, their, their central bank rates, uh, to much lower levels. They've done more quantitative easing. It hasn't helped to stimulate more growth. And so the other thing I would comment on uh, Policies that grow the workforce, trade policy, infrastructure spending, policies that improve skills are probably more the center of gravity, uh, which are going to affect uh, U.S. economic performance. And I think it pays to, to, to keep 
to broaden the discussion to other policies away from monetary policy. Yeah, just to be clear, those are not Fed policies, those are fiscal policies. They're not, but Sarah, our job is to call it out. Sarah Eisen back in Englewood Cliffs has a uh, question for you, New York Stock Exchange, sorry. Manhattan, yeah, hi, hi President Kaplan. So not just a divergence hi, among Sarah. central banks, but a divergence inside your central bank. I mean, why do you think there's such a wide opinion right now about where the economy is headed, how many rate cuts are needed, how much stimulus is needed? It's a little confusing to the market about just how aggressive the Fed is going to be. So let me try to put it in context. Um, I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges of this job is you got to be forward looking. What's happened up to now is not as important as to what we think is going to happen over the horizon, and that's inherently uncertain. Uh, and and the, the other thing is, this is a risk management job. And so I think some of the disagreement you may hear will be about how you weight uh, risk management. Uh, what I'm saying is, um, I, I think that uh, when the Fed funds rate is well above rates all along the Treasury curve, and we're seeing some weakness in manufacturing and global growth, I, I think it may make sense to, to, uh, to take some action on the policy rate from a risk management point of view, but different people have different points of view on how they'd manage those risks. And I'm actually, for one, I'm glad for the debate and for the disagreement. And when I go into these meetings, I listen to the opposing views. I think people listen to me and, and we listen to each other. And I think the debate's a healthy thing, actually. And finally, I, I was just curious about how you think the tariffs are filtering, filtering through to the economy, especially in anticipation of a new round of the remaining few hundred billion of Chinese imports that could affect the U.S. consumer. How does that factor into the forecast? So here's, here's what I'm hearing from business, and I spend an extensive amount of time talking to business leaders. Uh, if you ask me on April 30th, as I mentioned, I thought we we're going to grow at 2.5% plus. Then on May 1st, we had the China issue. But I found the big event that happened over the last three and a half months was the Mexico threat, at least to, uh, talking to businesses I talked to, in that it, it, it jarred them and made them realize even if we do have trade agreements, you could still have surprises. And since that point, a lot of businesses I speak to have become more cautious on CapEx and on expansion plans. The consumer stayed strong, but I think businesses now have, have internalized the trade uncertainty is going to be with us for some extended period of time, even if some of these bilateral trade issues get resolved. Uh, and so I see you, I think you see a much more cautious business community, and that's what I'm hearing. Robert, just one more thing. Um, you said you want to avoid rate cuts, but I heard you say you're more inclined to do them than, uh, than not. Is that fair to say? I'm saying I'm balancing. The reason I want to be careful about cutting rates unless we have to, cutting rates hurts savers, it pushes people to take more risk, uh, and, and I'm very cognizant of that. On the other hand, I'm also cognizant if we wait till we see weakness in the consumer we pro to make, take action, we probably waited too long, and I'm very well aware we don't have that much ammunition. Our tools are in the lingo asymmetrical. So I, from a risk management point of view, uh, I, if I see continued weakness, I'm gonna at least be open-minded about making some adjustment in balancing these various risks.